Hi, everybody. It's Gustavo again uh, here with another tasting. Today we're doing something extremely, extremely special. Not that the other ones haven't been, but something that I'm really curious to uh, to dive into. And we're doing the uh, the red wine from 2009. So uh, a very old vintage for us. In fact, the first vintage that we ever made wine for Mira Winery. So I'm very excited to taste this uh, to give you a heads up of what was going on in 2009. It was a, a pretty dry year, kind of hot. And so really good weather. I, I consider it one of the really top vintages of, of uh, the, the 2000s, 2000 through 2010, and just produced wines that were pretty nicely concentrated, really well balanced, nice acidity, juiciness, fruitiness, and things like that. And I think this wine should not be an exception. I'm curious to uh, see how this bottle is tasting. Of course, I've, I've pre-tasted other bottles when we decided which wines to release for, uh, for, for this event or this tasting or this series of tastings. And uh, curious to see, you know, there's, because the wine is, uh, has been in bottle for so long, uh, there's, a, there's a little bit of bottle to bottle variation, which is not to be anything to be surprised by. You know, each, each bottle kind of takes on a life of its own as it starts to age and, and the, the older they get. Uh, potentially, the more different one bottle can be from another. And even in, in some situations where you get a bottle where it seems like the wine is pretty much over with in terms of its life, and this in general, not, not about this wine, uh, you get another one the next day and it seems to be really, really good. So, you know, all that to say that uh, you can't necessarily write off a wine, especially when it's been aging, just because you get one bottle that maybe uh, has, has looked like, like it's expired. So with this particular bottle that we're going to taste now, and I haven't pre-tasted this one at all, so I haven't even checked to see if it was corked. I'm pretty confident about it. Uh, I really like the, you know, the cork has held up nicely. A lot of the times I want to get wines that have been around for this old, for this, uh, for this length of time, it's kind of a, a battle to get the cork out in one piece and you end up having to decant. So for those of you that know me, speaking of decanting, I'm not a big fan of decanting. Uh, however, on this wine, in, in some instances of some of the bottles that I've tried, uh, I would make an exception depending on how, uh, how soon you, you want to drink it and really enjoy it. Uh, I found, I looked this bottle out, I think, one time for a couple days, not too long ago, and it was pretty stellar the next day or 48 hours later, I forget exactly what it was, and kind of inspired me to maybe do that again with this bottle of wine, and maybe you guys can join me to retaste it. I'm going to try to do it on Saturday, 1 o'clock Pacific time on Instagram Live, something really quick, you know, just to have a, a check-in to see how it's doing, so I'm curious to see how that does. Anyway, back to this wine. So this is the first vintage for us, Mira Winer. We just celebrated our 10th anniversary last year. And the present that we gave to ourselves was the opening of this beautiful winery in Yountville. And uh, as before, I invite all of you to come check it out. It's a truly unique uh, experience. It's a beautiful place with magnificent views and, and pretty good wine to enjoy along the way. So hopefully you get a chance to come uh, pay us a visit as soon as we can open it back up again. 2009... Uh, was our first vintage. We didn't make that much wine that year. You know, we were primarily focusing on Syrah and Cabernet Franc and a little bit of Cabernet Sauvignon just to have in the portfolio. And so it was interesting. You know, what? one of the policies that I have with my growers is uh, I, I always invite the growers in, in the spring after harvest to come taste wine, taste the wines that I made with their wines uh, at the winery, you know, and see how it's doing. And, and maybe if, I, if I'm lucky enough, you know, in this case, I wasn't able to. Uh, have an older vintage that we can pop open and taste along with it to see how it's aging and for them to kind of see what the what the potential of their vines and and what kind of wines are being made from from their vineyards uh could be so it's very important for me it's important that way you know i do this in the in the springtime uh when things are just getting going in terms of the growing season and sometimes we have kind of a, a rainy day like we do today it's kind of a gray day and it, and it gives us a chance to be indoors and, and try wines and talk about different things and so, you know, to give a, a pretty critical evaluation to the grower of, uh, you know, a, a history of what I found in making the wine up to, to date that year. And of course, it's not a very long time, you know, because if we're harvesting in September, October, and it's uh, any, anywhere between March and April, it's not a, a lengthy amount of time in, in, uh, in the aging process, but it's enough to get a pretty good idea of which direction that wine is headed. And it's a point in time for me where I'm deciding what my next activity upon that wine is going to be. So whether I'm going to rack the wine, whether I'm just going to stir the barrels, whether I'm just going to leave it, leave it be and not mess with it, or maybe I find that the, the, the oak that the wine is getting is not necessarily what I was looking for, so maybe I can change into some other barrels and things like that. 
and get a pretty good evaluation of what the fruit is and share that with the grower. So the grower for this uh, uh, wine is the Hyde Vineyard in Carneros. And the reason this wine exists, we didn't necessarily uh, plan on making this wine. You know, back, back then, like I said, we only had a couple of wines to play with. And I felt pretty lucky that we had uh, the relationship with this grower to get this fruit. And so one of the things that uh, we got, one of the wines that we've already tried, uh, a newer vintage, was Cabernet Franc. And so this is uh, back in the day of uh, red blends not being that big of a deal here in the States yet anyway. Uh, you know, they've always been making red blends in Europe. But in terms of uh, what we were doing in terms of marketing and stuff like that in the U.S., nobody was really doing too many red blends at the time. There was a few and a handful, uh, but just, you know, not, not so much as maybe there is now. And so in tasting with the grower, and it's somebody I really respect, um, we just thought for the fun of it, he suggested, you know what, uh, let, let's see what these two taste like together. So I grabbed a, just a cylinder that I, I happened to have with me in the cellar. We were tasting out of barrels just like this, 100 milliliters, and I filled, you know, he said, just for fun, let's see what it tastes like a 50-50 blend, Syrah and Cabernet Franc. And I thought, yeah, it's a pretty unusual blend. You know, I've had red blends before. We know that uh, a lot of the Bordeaux and even California Cabernets are blended with uh, with other Bordeaux varietals, but not necessarily with anything outside of that. And so, to me, a uh, Syrah Cabernet Franc blend was was pretty unorthodox. You know, something uh, just, to me, it just kind of uh, twisted my brain a little bit because they come from two completely different areas of, of France. And being kind of a purist, it was kind of, kind of hard for me to digest. So, anyway, we decided to do it. And it was a 50-50 blend, 100% used barrels of Syrah, Clone 877, and it's the Syrah that we bottle under Syrah Hyde Vineyard, and the Cabernet Franc that we're bottling under Hyde Vineyard Cap Franc. And so it was really interesting to taste, and it was really powerful. Uh, it was extremely young because uh, Syrah, when it's really young, is really, really powerful, really big wine, uh, bigger than what, what a lot of people would consider big. And so... Uh, it, it was just, you know, we tasted it and we're like, yeah, this is pretty good, you know, but we kept it. We, I personally was, wouldn't say that I was so thrilled that let's, we got to bottle this, but I stuck it in my memory bank and knowing that I still had, you know, another 10, 12 months worth of aging in the barrel, um, I could keep visit, revisiting it and then make a decision eventually if we wanted to do that or not. So we never really planned to do it. And then when the next spring hit and we were getting ready to, uh, to order our bottling supplies and our labels and stuff like that, we gave it another try. And lo and behold, we were really surprised at how the wine had changed and how good it became. So we decided just to, to do 150 cases. I think it was that vintage. Uh, I think it was, we did three barrels of Cabernet Franc, three barrels of Syrah, both uh, used barrels, blended it and bottled it and uh, enjoyed it when it was young. And then we decided to lock it up for a while and, uh, and see how it was going to age. And so we kind of, we didn't forget about it. We just kind of left it aging for a while. And then just recently we started looking back into it. So I was, really um, pleasantly surprised to see how well this has aged, you know, because one of the, we know the Cabernet Franc ages really well out here. Syrah and Pinot on the red side, uh, not, not necessarily sure all the time, but, you know, having um, this top end fruit to go into it kind of gives you an assurance that it, it's probably going to be pretty good. You might check in on it and it might not be at the proper stage for aging, but then eventually, you know, it comes around and I think it, it's done a pretty good job of that. And so, by the way, one of the things that I didn't mention that I always mention up front is uh, if you have questions, please, you know, let's, I've really enjoyed having these interactive sessions that we've had before. And uh, it's been a surprise for me that we've been able to stretch out one wine talking for over an hour. So it's great. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, type them in and then uh, my moderator will text me the questions and then I'll answer the questions once I'm pretty much finished uh, blabbing about the wine. So please, uh, anything you think of, and it doesn't necessarily have to be about these wines specifically, but anything you think of about, you know, that you would want to ask a winemaker, um, please go ahead and do so. So, so anyway, on to the wine. So 50-50 blend Cabernet Franc uh, of, and Syrah, Syrah 877 clone. So the Syrah on its own has a lot of personality, like I was saying. It's, it's a rich and sweet tasting wine with a, a nice amount of acidity, not so much that it uh, cancels out the sweetness, you know, but it's still just a powerful, big, bold wine. Even if it comes from Carneros and a cooler area, the wine usually gets pretty ripe. And uh, by pretty ripe, I'm talking about, you know, we end up with, uh, you know, if, if my average alcohols on my wines are 14.5 on the Syrahs, it's, it's, it's not unusual to see a 15, 15.5. And I think even once vintage at is 16. So they tend to get pretty ripe out there in spite of the cool uh, 
growing conditions, but the growing conditions really help because it, it extends the hang time and it retains the acidity while you're uh, getting all these, these bold and rich characters into the wine. So instead of making this rich, flabby, uh, just viscous wine that has no savoriness to it, you know, and the acidity for me, if, if you've heard me before, is very important. You end up making this wine that's bigger, but it, the, the, the sugar and, and the alcohol eventually doesn't really overwhelm and, and it ends up making a really nicely balanced wine, um, even in spite of the fact that, that it produces just these ripe grapes at uh, 15 and a half uh, percent alcohol for the most part. The Cab Franc, on the other hand, is, is pretty much the opposite. So if you sat in on the Cabernet Franc talk that I did, um, I, you learned that the, the, the Franc from 2012, which is the one that we tasted along with the 14 or 13, I forget the other vintage still, uh, the 12 was from a much older uh, clone and a much older planting, and that's been pulled now. And so, of course, the 9 also comes from that same one, that same Franc that made the 2012 Cabernet Franc that we bottled. And so that vineyard is, is in a different area of this Hyde vineyard. It was only four rows, so really long rows. It doesn't, doesn't produce that much uh, grapes not, and consequently not that much wine. And it's uh, uh, grapes that never really get too ripe, regardless of how long you leave them out there because the, the, the age of the vines and the condition of the vines and the virus that's in some of the, that was in some of the, uh, of the vines you never get beyond really like a 24 bricks, 25 bricks situation. And that, you know, if you want to do the quick math when people talk about bricks and how that translates to alcohol, uh, you do a, roughly a 0.6 conversion and you get your alcohol, right? So at 24 bricks, you're looking at about 13, anywhere between, it depends on the yeast, right? But you're getting going to get anywhere between 13 and a half and 14 and a half alcohol. But you also get these uh, really, you know, long hang time that allows the Cabernet Franc to get its not only its sugar maturity and its um, uh, technical technological maturity, we call that, but also its its a uh, its phenolic maturity. And so the flavors that are in Cabernet Franc, similar to Cabernet Sauvignon, some of these herbal characters that that might stick around for a while, especially in a place like Carneros where where it's cool and it just takes a lot longer to get rid of that, and it requires a lot more precise viticulture to get rid of it. Uh, you know, it it it, it it's gonna take a while to get rid of these characters. And if we compare that to an area like Yellowville, where we are, where it's much warmer, you know, that would mean if we're leaving the fruit out for, for that much longer to get rid of these herbal and vegetal character characters here, we might end up with a wine like the Saran in the 14, five to 16% alcohol range. But in Carneros, again, because of this uh, cool climate down there and the condition of the vines at the time, we can pretty much rest assured that we're not going to get beyond 14.5 alcohol with it. And we're, we are going to be, be able to get rid of these vegetal characters. So in the end, uh, main, uh, produce this, a ripe Cabernet Franc without being overripe, but still retaining a, a lot of the essence of what Cabernet Franc is. And if you listen to that talk a couple of weeks ago, you know, there's a lot of uh, graphite and pencil shaving characters that I associate with Cabernet Franc. And it's a very aromatic grape, much more so than Cabernet Sauvignon for me. You know, where Cabernet Sauvignon can be more on the fruit side, Cabernet Franc is more on these other uh, kind of earthy type characters, more so than Cabernet Sauvignon. And then we make up for that with the Syrah having its own kind of fruitiness and its own kind of uh, spiciness. And by spicy, I don't mean hot, more the these spices that you smell that just kind of grow wild. If you've ever been in Southern France, there there's uh, some herbs that grow there that have this really intense aroma that I find a lot of the times in Syrah and, and, and even like olives black olive maybe in the straw as well so all that to say i think when you're thinking about putting the whole thing together you kind of have these this push and pull of flavors and characters that you know when we first tasted it like i was saying it seemed interesting but i wasn't sure how they were going to be able to play together eventually so the the result back then was you know it's only 150 cases we'll see where it goes it's not for for everywhere and uh we're just kind of excited to try it out it's something we weren't expecting to do so Anyway, let's uh, let's taste the wine. This is our old original label, and uh, I'm using a burgundy glass again because one, I love burgundy glasses, right? I wouldn't use these on Cabernet, but uh, on Cabernet Sauvignon that is, or Merlot. But I think on on this wine, um, because it's been in the bottle for so long, and I, I want to uh, aerate it a little bit more than I would maybe, uh, knowing from the, the last couple of bottles that I've opened. I decided to use a, uh, a burgundy shaped glass just for the aeration effect. So in pouring it, I would say that, you know, 
already I, from this distance i can smell it i can get the aroma and it's a it's a pretty intense aroma right and in looking at the color i'm really pleased by the color because it it doesn't show the signs of a wine that's aged you know there's a little bit of brick color just a tiny bit on the rim but for the most part it's still this pretty dark garnet fresh looking color which is uh something that's really positive to me so you know we're talking about alcohol alcohol is a preservative this one ended up being 14.5. I was just reading uh, an article that somebody wrote on a blog talking about alcohol and how some people have this bias against wines that have a lot a lot of alcohol. And who knows what that is really, right? Just because, um, you know, you, the, the thought is that you get drunk faster, I guess. But anyway, um, it doesn't really matter to me that much, the alcohol. It's not a really a quality... Uh, Parameter. It's not something that we analyze. It sent to the lab, and then we say, "Oh man, we're, there's something wrong with the wine. There's a lot of alcohol, or there's not enough alcohol." It's just something that's there that you get from the vintage, is the way I see it. And uh, having a wine that's balanced, where the alcohol doesn't stick out, or anything necessarily sticks out, even the acidity could be out of balance. You, know, you could have a high acid wine that's really sharp on the tongue, and it makes for an unpleasant experience. So, similar thing. You know, alcohol. Maybe you get a little, a, a little bit more because of the varietal. You know, and if you're one of those that doesn't like high alcohol, maybe you're you're turning your world off, you know, making your world that much smaller in terms of appreciation of wine. There's a lot of wines from warm areas of the world that are that, that are pretty high in alcohol that maybe you haven't thought about, and uh, they're worth definitely tasting. But anyway, this this wine, I'll get off my pedestal now and uh, get on, and and tell you more about the wine. So anyway, I'm really pleased with the way it looks. It's a really young, youthful color still, which is is really really great. And then smelling it, uh, I've gotten different characters in the wine. Uh, I think I've had maybe three other bottles of this in the recent past in testing it out and tasting it with, with um, my group here at the winery. Um, and I've gotten characters that range from, um, from fruit-driven fruit characters to uh, these really beginning of animal type characters that kind of go into this leathery character that uh, for me, you know, I wasn't surprised necessarily about the leathery character because being an aged wine, uh, that it, it's not necessarily a shock that you get a little bit of this leatheriness in the wine. But this one in particular is very fruity, very clean. Uh, I wouldn't say that I, that I smell either Cabernet Franc or Syrah, which is something that uh, is, is, a, is not necessarily a peculiar thing, but it's a, it's a fascinating thing, you know, because early on when I would taste it, in the first couple of years it was in the bottle, I, it either went into the Syrah direction or in the Cabernet Franc direction. It was one or the other, one or the other, and then eventually... Uh, it looks like it finally started just becoming the red wine that, that, as we labeled it, you know, it's not meant to be a Syrah, it's not meant to be a Cabernet Franc. And so I'm really, really impressed with that. And it's just this, it smells really fresh, which is um, really, you know, I'm really proud proud of that. I mean, I, I would have, uh, I would have anticipated it to be a little bit more aged and have more maybe of this uh, sherry character to it. But looking at the color, you know, it, it shouldn't be a surprise that it's so fresh and the legs are still nice and there's a viscosity to it. And if I had to uh, describe the aroma of this wine, it, it seems like in this case, 10 years later, uh, Syrah, plus Cap Franc, uh, Syrah plus Cap Franc equals Grenache. It's kind of what it reminds me of a Grenache or a Carignan in terms of the smell. Again, it's a, you know, warmer climate grape. If you've ever had this from Spain or... Uh, or even south of France, you, you kind of get this color. Some of the Chateauneuf de Pops kind of have this, this aromatic to it. But I'm not necessarily getting any of the uh, uh, herbs that I was talking about that I find in Syrah or any of these pencil shavings and uh, characters that I find in Cabernet Franc, which is uh, pretty interesting. All right, so I'm going to take a sip and see how, how it tastes. I think it's, it's it's a pretty outstanding wine, you know. It's um, I think the, the the age on this wine has just really allowed it to come together, and again in the in the uh, aromas following in the taste following what I found in the aroma, none of the varietals are dominating. There's one that coming through this wine with these two varietals. I'm really impressed of how fresh it tastes still, you know. Uh, I don't. I didn't get any of the uh, leathery character or, or the beginnings of this animal type character that I've gotten in the past, as I mentioned. And it's I 
I think the, the more it opens, the better it's going to be. You know, it's um, this specific bottle is not one that I think we have to wait around for to for it to open up. It's just showing really, really nicely. And maybe, you know, that's because of the glass that I'm using. It's allow, allowing it to open up. So if I was asked how much more life does this have, you know, on this last sip that I'm taking, take, that I've taken, there's a quite a bit of uh, astringency still, and and I didn't, I don't remember that from the other bottles that I had, and maybe it's because the aromas and, and the flavors were much more powerful than this, or maybe I was caught up in the in that leathery character of the the other bottles that I've had, but I find it's got a fair amount of tannin still, you know, and the tannin comes from both the Syrah and the Cap Franc, so. Knowing the, the, the acidity that's still coming through and, and the uh, tannin that's there, I would say this one would, would easily age for another five to seven years minimum, maybe even another 10. It, it tastes so fresh, but, you know, I go back to what I said earlier that if you, if you were, if you had 12 bottles of this, each bottle is going to be so different. And, you know, you open one that if you don't like the leathery character, might, you, you might be prone to think that the wines are pretty much done, but I would you know, hold on to it and just keep tasting it over time, keep enjoying it over time. And I think, one of the uh, funnest things that we could do is taste wines that have been aged for a while. You get a much different experience than when they're young. And, and it's just a much more, I would even venture to say a much more sophisticated wine than when it first came out and when it was just one varietal over the other. Yeah, I'm really, really pleased by this. So I see that um, there's questions coming through. The minute, because what I decided to do is when I was tracking down this bottle in our cellar, in our library upstairs, I saw that we had also the 2009 Cabernet Franc and the 2009 Syrah. And I just couldn't uh, uh, not taste these, you know, knowing that what the blend is like. Now, you know, I had this curiosity of, well, how does each individual wine taste now? You know, how well have these aged over the over the course of their uh, their uh, ten year life, ten year plus life, <clears throat> and how do they compare to the Syrah? Or I'm sorry, the the red wine. So it's something I just couldn't pass up. And this is one of the benefits of, of being the winemaker is we have to check into these wines eventually, right? Every now and then to see how it's going. Maybe uh, some of you might have this in your cellars. And you're thinking about popping it open and you'd like to know, well, how's it tasting? Should I open it or should I hold on to it? So I thought I'd be doing a public service here by tasting these two and also comparing how they are in relation to the, the red wine that I just tasted. So I decided to use the same glass on both. So again, burgundy glasses. I love the Syrah out of, in a burgundy glass. Cap Franc I usually prefer in a, in a Bordeaux style glass, but for this situation, and I've had uh, Cabernet Francs from various areas of, of France, it, and they, they always use different glasses there too. So maybe a Bordeaux style franc and a Bordeaux Cabernet glass and a Loire Valley Cab franc and more of a Burgundy style glass. So I decided just to keep the glass the same to try to not to have, uh, you know, try to have some, some, some kind of consistency there. So I'm going to pour the Syrah. I'll show you guys the corks. And again, I'm really, um, really impressed with the corks. You know, we, we like to use a uh, I, I, I love using corks more than anything uh, for closing. I, I'm not, not a fan of screw caps. I'm not a fan of the, the fake corks or even the, the, the cheaper corks that might have uh, discs on the, on the ends to try to prevent it from having a uh, cork tank. We pay a lot of money for really nice corks, and uh, that's a guarantee that it's going to be very minimal that you have any kind of cork tank. But the, the cork is part of the reason the wine will continue to age and evolve, and I think it, it's a very wise investment for people that are making fine wine to use really nice corks in their bottles. So I've been in situations before where, you know, when you're buying, let's say a million corks, uh, and you're able to shave off a penny off each one, that's, it, it adds up to a significant amount of money for, you know, companies that think that way. But I think it's better to spend that, that extra penny and, uh, and, and get really nice corks to allow the wines to really time travel. You know, we're, we're traveling back in time with these wines and the corks are actually allowing us to do that. You know, I'm really, really happy with this. So that'll be a phone call to my cork supplier later to give him a pat on the back. All right, so I'm going to pour the Cap Franc close to me. 
And by the way, what I said about the red wine is true of these wines. So these, you know, I haven't tasted these. I can't even remember the last time I've had these. So, you know, what I was saying about the bottle variation and stuff like that is going to hold true for these. So the difference here too, interestingly enough, uh, is that the Cab Franc would not have been filtered and the Syrah was filtered. That I, that I do remember because I'm a staunch believer in, in Syrah's not getting spoiled by that microorganism, the, this other yeast that, that, that basically gives this uh, animal or manure character in the wine. And I try to avoid that at all costs with Syrah and with uh, Pinot Noir. Bordeaux varietals, I think they do much better under those conditions. So I, I don't filter those because that goes back to my thing about trying to be as natural and hands-off and innocent winemaking is, is what we came up with the other day in making the wine. So that's the big difference. The red wine was sterile filtered as well because having the Syrah uh, uh, in it, uh, I was careful not to uh, you know follow the pattern of Syrah in making that wine as well in terms of its filtration. So anyway, um, those are the primary differences besides the varietal differences, of course. And I think I'll start with the Cabernet Franc to see how it is. So already looking at the wine, and I can see that, I don't know if you can, you probably can't make it out here, but if, if I show you the, the ends of the corks, the one on my right is the Cabernet Franc, and it's a little bit lighter color on the cork, so there's more less color that came out, and, and the uh, Syrah one is much darker, right? There's no sediment on here, so kind of a cool thing. It seems, seems like the wines, and I'm looking at the bottle here, I don't really see any, any sediment on the bottle on any of them, so... Kind of a wise move to not not uh, decant them to get them off the junk, and uh, now I'm curious to see how it's held up. You know, the the night I've always been a big fan of Cabernet Franc, and so I've been drinking the, or tasting the twelve quite a bit, as, as I mentioned before in the Cabernet Franc video, and I just haven't had the nine nor the ten in forever. I can't even remember the last time, so I'm really curious to see how this is held up. So looking at the color. And I know I already cheated and smelled it, but I couldn't wait. Uh, it's it's a pretty nice color, too. You know, it's it's got, I was showing you the corks. There's just less color in the Cabernet Franc than there is in the Syrah. And that's just kind of true in general. Cabernet Franc is not a varietal that necessarily has a lot of color. And especially when you have the vines in the condition that we have there with the, with the virus in the vines and, and, you know, taking a long time to ripen and, and, and the vines not doing that much work, per se, right? So it's not a surprise that... Uh, wine as there is in the red wine or the Syrah and also in looking at the uh, at uh, maybe the the oxidation of the wine there's a little bit more of uh, the brick color around the perimeter so a little bit more aging on this than there is on the red wine and maybe that's where the red wine was getting it um, it's a uh, kind of brickish hue on on the on the rim and but still you know it still looks pretty good I would say you know for a 2009 I think it looks great there's still a pretty vibrant color there. And, uh, you know, I've seen wines that are young, served by the glass, that have this this uh, brickish type uh, color around the rim. So I'm not too too worried about that. So this is not, not intense. But there, you know, it's very elegant. It's very Cap Franc. If I compare this to the 12, the, the 12 has a much more uh, expressive nose much bigger nose than this it's a little bit more subdued and that could be just because it needs more time to open up in the glass but it's definitely there it's definitely cabernet franc and there's zero of this animal or iodine or uh or leather character in this wine So very fresh, very fresh. I'm, I'm really happy to see that. Um, still noticeable acidity. There's a tannin still framing the outside of the wine. I get a lot of uh, small red berries as the primary flavor, maybe even a little bit of pomegranate, which is a little bit not my usual uh, describer for Cabernet Franc. I save that for maybe more like really rich pinots. But it just has a lot going on. You know, it's a... Pretty outstanding Cabernet Franc. I don't remember how much we actually made of this, this vintage, but it was somewhere between 100 and 200 cases. So, again, the vineyard doesn't produce much, and I peeled some off to do the red wine.
pretty outstanding, I would say. I had a, a bottle of, uh, is, this is another situation where it's good to be a winemaker. I had a bottle of Cheval Blanc 2001 about uh, 10, 14 days ago. And one of the things that I've been doing because I'm bored, I get bored at home with the sip situation, the shelter in place, is I decided to start opening some of these old bottles that I've just been hanging on to to see how they're doing. And so I opened a 2001 Cheval Blanc. And that vintage, you know, Cheval Blanc is kind of the standard for Cabernet Franc, for me anyway. But it's blended with Merlot. So some years it's more Merlot, some years it's more Cabernet Franc. And it just depends on the year uh, how much Cabernet Franc is in there, right? Well, the, the vintage that I had was, uh, I think it was like a 60-40 Merlot. So it was more on the Merlot side. And I would say, you know, that, that wine is probably pretty valuable right now. I didn't bother to look to see just because... I wanted to drink it. I didn't want to keep storing it and seeing how, how it's going to age, how it's, how expensive it's going to get because I'm going to drink. And so, um, you know, I was, it's one of those wines that I was really, really impressed by how well it held up and it had pretty much zero signs of aging. It was still really fresh, young, vibrant color, everything, aromatic. You know, they don't have the density in, in Bordeaux that we get here most of the time, but this kind of reminds me of that. I mean, it doesn't taste like Cheval Blanc, but the characters of how well it's aged. The Cheval Blanc was, you know, seven, eight years older than this. But, you know, the story just to say that how well Cabernet Francs can age, I guess, is really what I'm getting at. And even though that was blended with Merlot, it's just a testament of how well those varieties can age. And I think this particular Cabernet Franc still has a long life to come. On the one hand, I'm happy that I opened this because I really wanted to taste it. But now I'm thinking I've got three open bottles of wine. And what, when am I going to taste them all? I guess I'm going to save the red wine until Saturday so I can show you guys and share with you guys how it's tasted after a couple days. These other two, though, might not be so lucky. They might not make it that far. So that's the front. Delicious. Delicious front. All right, so let's go to the Syrah then. And so the Syrah, of course, holds a very special place in our hearts here at Mira, because if it wasn't for the Syrah, we probably wouldn't be around. You know, this is basically the wine that started our company. And uh, the, the, the story there, and I see there's a settlement here on the, on the back side of the bottle. Uh, our story basically is because of this Syrah, we decided to start this wine company, you know, and I had met Bear, my, my partner in crime here and the proprietor. In D.C. three or four years before 2009, and uh, we decided that we wanted to do something together, and we, that we wanted to make some wine, and, you know, he didn't know as much about wine at the time, and he, he was a guy that had made, but he drank plenty of wine, and one of his favorite wines is Syrah. And so when we were looking, I told him, well, look, when I met him in 2006, I think it was, or whatever, I said, look, we can make wine. We don't necessarily have to have vineyards. You know, a lot of people think that you have to have your uh, vineyards to make wine. In fact, most growers sell their fruit. Not a lot of growers make wine around here anyway. And my uh, argument was we have to have the best possible grapes so that we can make the best possible wine. Right. That makes it easier for me. If I have pretty good grapes, I can I can do a better job of making the wine. And so we stayed friends and uh, we kept in touch and whatnot. And in 2009, similar to, I mean, the situation now with, with the virus is, is a little different, but you know, it, it was a down economy in 2009, but a really good vintage. And so growers started having fruit available, fruit that you would never think of that you could get your hands on was becoming available. And so I already had a relationship with the Hyde family because I'd been working with them before. And I, I was always at the top of their list of people to call when they have fruit available, right? So this time around, they called me. I said, uh, you know, I'd love to take that Syrah. I don't make a Syrah where I am now, but I'm thinking um, if you would sell it to me, I'd love to make a vineyard designated Syrah uh, with, with that fruit. And because of the track record I had with them, they, they agreed uh, to sell me these grapes and eventually we ended up getting a bunch of other grapes too, as you've seen. And so that was kind of the birth of, uh, of Mira was this Syrah was, was the one that really was the impetus to start this wine company and for us to start making these wines. So you know, with that uh, story in place, I'm even more curious to see how this wine is held up. So let's let's take a look at the Syrah 2009. First of all, the color really, really dark. Still, really very, very, very minimal signs of aging. A little bit of the brick color that I keep mentioning that, that's uh, 
kind of a, a, a tip off for me that, that it's got a little bit of age on it, but not a whole lot. Very, very small amount. Still extremely dark. I see I got a little bit of sediment in my glass here. I'm going to take that out with my finger, see what it is. Anyway, uh, let's see, I'm pull that out there too. And so, uh, really, really good color still. So th this could pass as a, as a new wine, I think, easily, just by looking at it. And so let's uh, give it a little spin and give it a little taste, smell first. This definitely has more of the aged wine character in it. Definitely smells more like a wine that's been in the cellar for a little while, at least right now. So when I mentioned earlier some of those uh, sherry type characters that you get in aged wine, I get a little bit of that in here. But I feel like there's other things trying to push through that that are going to come through maybe after the wine's been open for a little while longer. Still, you know, there's none of that, none of that animal or, or leathery character. More of a more, it's more on the spice type character. Maybe a little bit of a cooked vegetable, but I think that's going to go away with more exposure to air. Not quite as fruity as as I would have uh, as I remember it being when it was young, but maybe that'll come later. So it just needs time, or maybe it needed decanting, I would say, for the aromas. Okay, so let's see how it tastes. It tastes like an older Syrah. It doesn't have um, the big fruit power that it has when it's young, but it's evolved into something else. There's a lot more of the spice element to it. I don't really get the that spice that I was describing that you might have come across it's called Garrigue in the south of France. I'm not really getting that now, but I get a lot of tannin still, a lot of astringency, and, a, and then a lot of youthfulness. Aside from the flavor, I get a lot of youthfulness in the wine. Pretty broad still, acidity, long finish. Funny, I get a little bit of vanilla. This wine is aged almost exclusively in 10-year-old barrels, even the, the wine that we make now. It's extremely neutral oak, and I would not expect to have any vanilla flavor coming from barrels. So it's vanilla coming from the fruit itself. It's very intense, and this is a 15 fiber, so it doesn't taste like an alcoholic wine, and maybe that's something that's helped preserve it along the way is uh, this, this higher uh, alcohol level, but also this tannin that it has has, has made the wine survive for so long. But again, I go back to the cork. So I'm going to taste the red wine again. And then some of you may be thinking this and I'm going to do it. If you bear with me for a second, I didn't think to do this before. I'm going to go grab another glass and then I'm going to make a blend out of the two wines that are the, the, the Syrah and the Cabernet Franc. I'm going to blend it with my, since I have my cylinder here, and see how that compares to the one, the blend that was already made 10 years ago. So bear with me just for one second while I get a glass. And this is kind of what happens when I'm doing these things. You know, it's a, you're, you're sitting here, you're tasting, and then the next thing you know, you're, you're, you're doing something completely different than what you planned on doing. So that's kind of what makes this fun. So I'm going to do exactly what we did at the barrel stage in 2000, would have been 2010. And I'm just going to put 50 mils of Syrah. And 50 milliliters of Cabernet Franc, and that'll be my 50-50 blend. And I know my glasses are clean, but I always have this habit of smelling them. Pour it into my glass, 100 milliliters. And let's see how it looks. So how do we compare it with the 09 that was in bottle? <clears throat> Drink just wanted to go dark on me. So I would say already much different. It, it smells much more of each of the individual wines over here than this one. 
The red wine just has its own personality. And this is something important to mention. You know, this is this is an option that I have in the cellar. I'm 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 one that likes to wait until the last minute to do any blending for the most part, right? And so some people they like to blend early on. Like uh, uh, there's a winery up the road that's really famous that you probably heard of called Opus One. That's kind of a joke. Uh, they do all of their blending. You know, they work with uh, just a, they make a Bordeaux red wine essentially. It's a red blend, all Bordeaux varietals. They do all their blending in, in in November. By November, they have the wine that they're going to bottle already blended and going into barrel. And so it's one approach. Right? There, there's a lot of people that work that way. And it's kind of a Bordeaux method. Uh, when I work with Michelle Roland, I learned that sometimes you have to you have to give the wine enough time to really express itself. And maybe what you didn't think was good at one point in time becomes really good eventually. And so that's kind of the, the approach that I decided to take is. You know, even even though most of my wines are, are not blends, they're single varietals, uh, but I have different barrels to blend with. I always like to wait as much as possible. Like in the case of making this red wine and it, its modern version called Jimmy D's Red Blend is the modern version of the red wine. You know, when when we decided to call this red wine, we pretty much ran out of ideas, honestly. So, you know, we came up with the name Mira that took us a really long time to, to find the proper name for us. So we decided, you know what, let's call it red wine. We we don't know if we're ever going to make this again. And then four or five years later, we decided to make uh, Jimmy D's Red Blend, which is kind of a similar blend to this, but we threw in an additional varietal. So on that Jimmy D's, I know I'm going off on a tangent here. Uh, the Jimmy D's is Syrah and Petit Verdot primarily. And then the first vintage had some Cap Franc. The third uh, uh, peg in that story is always going to be a Bordeaux varietal. So it's always going to be Syrah and Petit Verdot. Uh, at least up until now. And then the third could be a Cabernet Franc, could be Cabernet Sauvignon, could be Merlot. So kind of a modern version of uh, of the red wine. So the first one that had Cabernet Franc, Petit Verdot, and, and Syrah. Anyway, um, back to the story. So, you know, I, I do all my blending towards the end. And so, you know, there's arguments about whether you should allow your wine to uh, to kind of marry in, in, the, in the in the barrel so that when you bottle it and you're ready to release it, it, it won't take as long to come together in the bottle. I feel kind of the other way. I want to give the wines as much of a chance to make it into the, the bottling that I want. And so I let them age as much as I can. Like, you know, I'm talking about 100% varietals again. Syrah, maybe the, the, the wine that comes out of the press, I keep that completely separate because it tastes radically different than the Syrah. Maybe I need to work that a different way and I need time to do it. So... I'm more of a believer in late blending than early blending is, is essentially what I'm trying to say. So there, I said it. So anyway, back to the uh, comparison of the, the new, uh, the recently blended red wine coming from bottles versus the one that uh, was bottled uh, 10 years ago, essentially. So as I was saying, the, uh, the one that I just blended has a lot more of the characteristics of the wine that, that's in the, in the two glasses here from each individual varietal. And that's not really a surprise, you know, I didn't get into this. And, and again, you know, maybe different bottles would give me different results because they've all aged at different rates. And I would say the, you know, the red wine is, is just really its own thing. So. That's really interesting to say, really interesting to taste the, um, the just made red wine doesn't have the body that the red wine that was in the bottle does. And uh, it still has the acidity, but it's just a little bit leaner, which is re really interesting that uh, the one in the bottle. Is just much more dense, which is fascinating. You know, that's just kind of kind of how it is with wine. You know, th th this is something that we we couldn't have measured 10 years ago to know, OK, this wine's going to show this density that's just not not what the individual wines are going to be later on. So pretty interesting. I hope you enjoyed that little experiment there. And with that, I'm going to take a look. So let's see. So let me scroll up. All right. Yeah. Tiagin. Does tasting this now make you consider going back to or toward more of a 50-50 blend for, for the Jimmy D's? All right, so that's a good question. And thanks for joining. Yeah, it's great to have you. And, uh, you know, the Jimmy D's, I would say that it's kind of like a, 
the thing that I can kind of make up as I go along. And so it's, it, when we first made the wine, we were, you know, and, and this is, this is a tough thing to do. It's like when we first made the wine, we decided, okay, this wine's not going to have a profile every year might be different. And let's try to stick to that. And so the first year that we made it, the wine was so delicious that we, we decided, okay, maybe we should try to replicate this again, the second vintage. And uh, we decided, you know, let's just try to stick to our guns and make the Jimmy D's be this wine. This is fun, right? That, that that's made up of uh, a winemaker's blend for that season. And which is kind of what we did with this red wine originally. That was kind of the, the inspiration there is let's do something fun. That's kind of out of the ordinary. So I think, Thinking about Jimmy D's uh, going forward, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna stick to my guns and just kind of have a, a, a variation of wines where there there might not be any consistency from vintage to vintage of how that wine is made. So there's a lot of parameters that I could explore there, and you know it's, it's something I've been thinking of over the last couple of months of, of of how to carry that one forward. So I think that's what I'm gonna do. I I, I think I still like to keep it Syrah as the base, and then see what what the rest of the material is gonna be. So. See from Oscar, have any of your practices changed from when you did this blend? And do you treat these varietals different for, from your mono varietal and camera labels? Well, uh, that's a really good question, Oscar. And to, to be uh, honest with you, um, the first vintage, right, we had one Syrah and one Cabernet Franc to blend, right? And as we've uh, gone along, uh, the grower planted the uh, same varietal, different clones in different areas. And so the birth of Jimmy D's that I was just talking about is exactly that. We had another Cabernet Franc and another Syrah to deal with, right? And and the grower asked me, I want to try all these other clones of these two varietals. Uh, would you be able to make wine with those, right, for me? And, and can we can we evaluate those lots? And I said, yeah, sure. You know, and in my mind, I'm thinking it's not very much. It's four rows of Cabernet Franc, four rows of Syrah, Alban clone Syrah and a new clone, a Cabernet Franc from Bordeaux. And so my thought was, okay, well, you know, in the end, I'll just, I'll keep it separate. Like I just said, I keep everything separate till the end, and then I'll just blend everything. Well, what happened was that the, the clone of Cabernet Franc and the clone of Syrah were so different from the original clones uh, that I ended up just, you know, trying to figure out what I could do with those at the time. And so that's when we decided to make this fun blend, thinking back to the red wine that we had made in 2009. And so the difference in that Jimmy D's is that the, the clone of Syrah is called Alban clone and the Cabernet Franc that went into that original, the original two vintages of, uh, of Jimmy D's was a, a, a modern clone of Cabernet Franc from Bordeaux called 214, right? And the numbers don't really mean anything. I'm not sure how they come up with the numbers, but it, it has a much different character than the Cabernet Franc that we were already producing from this much older clone that had been in the valley for a while. And so that's basically the approach is, of course, the, the winemaking is a little bit different. The, uh, the amount of fruit when you have four rows to work with is, is much less fruit. So you have to be a lot more careful in how you, how you treat that fruit and how you make the wine. And so ultimately, you end up making a wine with a little bit different flavor characteristics than maybe the, the, the Syrah that we're already used to that we've been bottling, you know, from a different clone or the Cabernet Franc. Uh, I, interestingly enough, though, the Cabernet Franc, after it's gotten some age on it, this new clone has taken on a completely different life. And so uh, the Cabernet Francs that we've been making lately are all from this newer clone. So I stopped using the Cabernet Franc to make my red blend, and I started using it to make my Cabernet Franc bottling. Right. Mira, is it as medium dark ruby purplish as it looks on camera? I don't even see a lightened edge. Looks like a good one for a long time for a while longer. Yes, it's a very dark color and there's hardly anything, any of these wines. This is the one in the bottle. I mean, it looks much better than the one I just blended in terms of uh, the, the darkness. And I, I definitely think, in terms of how rich the color is, I definitely think that it's a wine that can be aged for much longer. Uh, with the caveat again, that you know, when you open the bottle, just make sure what, to smell it and then make the decision of how you want to handle the wine based on the way that it smells and that taste that you first have, you know, because it's been in there for a while. So, uh, you know, this bottle is showing a certain way. And so I'm happy to pour it directly from the bottle. Uh, but, you know, other bottles might have other characteristics that maybe need air to blow off. So, but I think for sure this one will age for at least another five, seven years easily. I mean, I'm really impressed with how well this has held up. I'm really proud of that. All right, so from Oscar, 
of the ones you have tasted for the virtual tastings, which one has surprised you the most? Which one has been your favorite? Well, Oscar, that's a, I would say that this one here is the one that surprised me the most. And it's because it, it's the one in front of me. It's because it's true. Uh, you know, this is the one that, that maybe for lack of a better term was the most risky to show because it's, it's the oldest wine. And there's a time period where I tried basically, uh, you know, the, the wine wasn't stored in proper conditions, but I went through like six, six or seven bottles three or four years ago uh, to see what was up with the wine. And because of the poor storage conditions, the wine just was not very good. And uh, I was lucky, you know, this was in a different part of the country where I tasted this. Uh, I was lucky when I came back home that uh, I looked into it and I found that the wine that was stored in proper conditions was still holding up nicely. And so I would say the biggest surprise for me is definitely these three wines essentially right and and i've had some of the other wines uh, that we made early on the the 2010 pinot that that, that was the first vintage of the pinot that I, I had about three or four months ago because i had a bottle that i just happened to come across i was really amazed and proud of how well my wines have aged and that's something that i strive for i want the wines to age you know i don't want the wines 10 years later to taste like they did when they were young i mean i think that would be kind of foolish in a sense, you know, I want the wines to continue to evolve and develop their, the characters that they're going to develop in the bottle. So, you know, to answer your question, this wine, I'm really proud of this wine. I, I mean, I'm really impressed with the way it is and being uncertain of the blend like we were when, when we first tasted it with the grower and not knowing how it was going to age, you know, because I've had experience with Syrah and Pinot and Cabernet Sauvignon aging and even white wines aging. I didn't have experience with the Syrah Capron blend at all, and much less with the Syrah Capron blend that had been aged for 10 years. So I would say I'm really impressed with this, and I'm really, really proud of this guy, you know? And I'm really proud of the, the individual components as well, because I think they've aged really, really nicely too. So I, I look forward to continuing to evaluate. All right, so let's see the next question. Do you work with Petit Verdot and why yes or no? So, Oscar, people think that I'm paying you to ask me these questions because you're asking me the kind of questions that I love to answer because I love Petit Verdot. It's one of my favorite varietals. And, and as I mentioned in, in the newest incarnations of the red wine, which is now called Jimmy D's, a good chunk of what's in there, or you know, 30% or so, is Petit Verdot. And I became a big fan of Petit Verdot when I worked in Europe. And uh, some of my favorite wines from, from Tuscany, there's one in particular called Castello de Rampola. And they make a wine called Vigna del Cheo. They're in the heart of Tuscany. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the, the town. Manzano is the name of the town they're in. And there's a really famous butcher there. If you ever go there, there's a really famous butcher that has just outstanding uh, outstanding meat, essentially, right? But some this is kind of like the heart of the, all the top county producers are here. But they all make super Tuscans, right? And so when we were looking to, uh, to uh, modernize the winery I was working at, Ornelia in Tuscany, this is one of the places we visited, and uh, the winemaker there was this really famous consulting winemaker that was kind of like uh, the father of modern Italian winemaking, called Giacomo Takis. He was our consultant, and so these people, you know, this, this winery made this blend uh, where it was 75% uh, Cabernet and 25% Petit Verdot, right? And so what I had learned uh, before I had gone to that place was Petit Verdot around here, and I think it's still true, is... is you, you don't want a lot of it in your blend because it really changes the profile of your wine. It really kind of takes it over and your Cabernet Sauvignon with a lot of Petit Verdot or a fair amount, not even a lot, a fair amount of Petit Verdot will completely change into a Petit Verdot. And so uh, before I left there and, and the Petit Verdot that I worked with here in Napa Valley, it just wasn't planted in the right places. It never really produced the Petit Verdot that I experienced while I was in Europe. And funny enough, when I when I worked at uh, Ornelia, you know, the, the government in Europe is much more strict about uh, what you can and cannot plant and what wines you can and cannot make and what you can and cannot call them, right? Here, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot more straightforward. And so Petit Verdot was not allowed to be planted in the region where I was working. and But we planted it, you know, we were working with Michelle Roland at the time, too. And we just, we called it the Sangiovese PV clone is how we got around it. So kind of a, you know, I think 20 years later, it's, it's a, it's a story that I can safely tell. 
And so the Petit Verdot that I worked with in, in Tuscany was just this completely different animal. And when I came back to work here in, in, in Napa, I decided to pursue Petit Verdot. And so the, the grower that I used to make, we make 100% Petit Verdot here at, at, at Mira. And uh, we also, like I mentioned, use, use some of it for Jimmy D's. And I was using it to blend beforehand. And so uh, there's a grower in Rutherford where we get our Petit Verdot from that I asked them if they could plant a small amount of Petit Verdot for me because I, I just think it's, it's such a good uh, grape to grow here in the Napa Valley because of the weather that we have. You know, the, the name implies that it's a green tasting, maybe even herbal grape. But if you plant it in the right place in Napa and where I worked before in Napa, we had it down in Carneros where it's too cool maybe for it. And you retain these green characters. If you're up in the middle part of the valley, where you have pretty warm weather to get it uh, ripe and get rid of those green characters, you're going to have a pretty nice Petit Verdot. So um, I would highly recommend trying our Petit Verdot if you're into that. It, it's such a phenomenal wine. Uh, it's, a, it's, again, a very powerful blender. When I've used it to blend uh, with my top wines uh, here or you know, when I worked at Robert Mondavi, the most I would use in Cabernet was like 3%. So a very tiny amount, just because of what I said earlier, it, it completely changes the profile of the wine from this Cabernet Sauvignon to this Petit Verdot. However, what I found when I went to Tuscany then, with tasting this Vigna del Cheo, is that if you put a lot of Petit Verdot in there, the wine just becomes, a, a, in, in a blended situation, it just becomes this whole other wine. And so even though that maybe they were shooting to make, shooting to making a Cabernet Sauvignon out of this Vigna del Cheo, the Cabernet, uh, sorry, the Petit Verdot just made the Vigna del Cheo a Vigna del Cheo. It wasn't a Cabernet Sauvignon, it wasn't a Petit Verdot, it was this red blend made from these two varietals that was this specific labeling. So I love I love Petit Verdot. I think it's delicious. I think it's a, it's a, it's a good uh, wine to have in your toolkit for blending because when you're short on color or when you're short on fruitiness or when you're short of a tannin, that's a pretty solid wine to go to to give you a little bit of that. And so that's one of the reasons you know, when in, in the Cabernet Sauvignons that I made in the past for us here, our Napa Valley specifically, I always liked having a little bit of Petit Verdot around. Again, because of the pure uh, pureness that I'd like to follow with my Bordeaux being Bordeaux varietals, you know, I could maybe use Syrah instead of Petit Verdot, but I choose to use a, a Bordeaux varietal to, to give me that little extra edge to give that wine that little oomph, that little bit of oomph that maybe was missing without it. So... That's a good question, and so hopefully that's a, that's enough of an enticement for you to try the Petit Verdot. So I'm going back to uh, the red wine blend, and now it's been open for a little bit. And it's still very juicy in, in the nose. It's still very aromatic. Some, uh, maybe like some fleshy ripe cherry now. It's kind of cherry season here, and I had some over the weekend, so maybe that's why I'm thinking of that, but I'm thinking about later in the cherry season when they get really dark and ripe and how fleshy they are and how much color there is in, you know, when you peel off the skin and you look at the, the flesh inside, that's kind of what it reminds me of now. Continues to taste delicious. All right. Thanks, Oscar. Great. The, it, Oscar says great story and it has the benefit of being true. So, I love it. So anyway, uh, last chance to get any questions in there, you know, um, I'm going to try the other wines. If you're interested, to, I'll just go through these really quickly to see how they are. And I'll start with the, the Cabernet Franc and see how that's kind of evolved. And it's taken on a, a little bit more of the aged character. So there's still some caver underlying Cabernet Franc character, that uh, pencil shavings, maybe rock, stony character, but it, it's not as intense maybe as it was when I first opened the bottle. And it's kind of leaned out and maybe I'm getting that, that perception because I've been tasting the red wine, but it seems like a leaner wine now than it was when I first opened it. And I think what I'm going to do instead of drinking this over the next day or two, I'll, I'm going to take these and when I retaste the red wine on Instagram on Saturday, I'm going to retaste those two as well just to see how they're doing. All right, let's see uh, Let's see how the Syrah is. So the Syrah continues to have the same aroma that it had uh, when I first opened it. So it, it doesn't have 
that that uh, aroma that I had early on when it was young that I described with this white white pepper, you know, uh, the garrigues, uh herbs that, that you smell in southern France. But it still has a pretty nice intensity. And now with a little bit of air, I find that the tannins have kind of mellowed out, me mellowed out a little bit. And now I get a little bit of cocoa powder, which is interesting, you know, because, again, when I think of cocoa, I think of barrels. And, again, this wine not having been aged in new barrels, it surprises me that it has these characters that remind me of oak. So it's a little bit more on the sweet side now, you know, than, than it was when I first opened it. And so let me try the blend that I just made. And the blend is starting to taste more like a blend, but it still, it doesn't taste like the, like the red wine. So I know maybe some of you are wondering, so which of those three, if we leave out the, the blend that I just made, is is the one that's tasting the best right now and i would say the red wine for sure i'm really enjoying this red wine bottle so i'm hoping it makes it to the weekend so i can do this instagram live it's gonna be a tough one all right let's see if i got one more question here and i'm happy to answer as many questions we got oscar what are the chances of Cabernet Sauvignon schweitzer in your virtual tasting promo very, very good chances, Oscar. So um, we're working on uh, the next round of virtual tastings or, or whatever we're calling these. And so I think Schwab is one that's coming up. So we're trying to figure out uh, when, number one, but also uh, what it's going to entail. Is it going to be one Schweizer? Is it going to be a, a fight? We'll see. So stay tuned. Um, it's coming pretty soon. You know, we're thinking uh, we want to do something by Father's Day to give you a hint, so, but we just haven't figured out the details yet. But uh, thanks for asking. So if there aren't any more questions. I want to thank you guys for, for joining me. And I really appreciate uh, the, the regulars that have been with us and all the questions that come come our way. And uh, let's see if there's one more. I think I just realized. But anyway, um, I, I really enjoyed doing these. And I'm glad to have this uh, uh, intimate group of people that are really interested in, in, in knowing about the wines that, that we make here. And, and how they're made. And uh, I look forward to sharing more of these as we go along. And just like Oscar, you know, was asking this question about the Schweitzer. If you guys have any suggestions or, uh, or a request of something that, that, that you would like for us to do, I'm really happy to uh, take those uh, requests and, 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 and see what we can do. You know, I think uh, the more we talk about wine and the, the more we demystify it and make it more mystic at the same time, uh, the more fun it is for everybody. So I really appreciate everybody that's been uh, joining joining me for the last several weeks. And uh, with that, I'm going to sign off. And thank you so much. I hope you have a great weekend. And if you can, turn, tune in Saturday for a quick see how these ones are doing around 1 o'clock Pacific time. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day.